So I'd like to begin by showing you this um, tetrahedron, I guess now, instead of a triangle, that we like to use in material science between processing, <coughs> performance, properties, and structure. And that is, if you synthesize a material in a certain way, you process it, it inevitably will have certain structure, it'll have certain properties, and that will drive the performance. And we are able to characterize this. Now, in the US, we spend about $245 million to fly and operate airplanes. And the largest contributor to this cost is from the fuel that it takes to propel 970,000 pound machine through the air. For example, it took me $107,000 to fly from LA to Zurich. It was a really, really last minute ticket. So <laughs> the reason why that happens is because the airplanes are very heavy. And in material science, this is a so-called material property space, so the strength and the density are tightly coupled. So materials that are very, very strong are also very heavy and dense, and vice versa. So these are foams and flexible type materials. So wouldn't it be great if we could make materials in that white space? So imagine this world where you have this airplane that's really efficient and powerful, but weighs as little as a toy airplane, or when you for example, drive your car home, you could pick it up afterwards and put it on the roof. I'm not sure why you'd want to do that, but you could. Um, or imagine a world where there's the Golden Gate Bridge and all the materials that it took to construct it can fit in the palm of your hand. Well, we think we figured out a way how we can approach such a world. And that is by introducing the concept of architecture into the material design. What you see are some of our micro trusses and nano trusses. And these structures are comprised of about 99% air, actually even more than that. And we can make them out of a different variety, large variety of materials. You can see there's one sitting on top of the dandelion. The reason why they're very strong is because we are using the concept of architecture within the material design. So we're starting from a tangible object that can fit in your hand and then reducing the dimensions down to microns, maybe even down to the nanometers, and I told you they were hollow, so the thicknesses here are on the order of 50 and even below nanometers. So going back to this property space of the strength versus density, what we know now is that there's a certain, there's a certain space that we're trying to hit, and there's a theoretical maximum that's actually good enough that would really propel us into this world where we can design materials that are really, really lightweight and at the same time very, very strong. And so that's the white space that we're shooting for. I'd like to spend a little bit of time explaining to you how we make them. So we use this so-called two-photon lithography to write a three-dimensional structure in a polymer. So we raster the, this cone, the conversion cone, through space to generate a sacrificial scaffold. We then coat it with a material of interest and then expose the internal polymer scaffold and then etch it out. So this is the schematic of what a two-photon lithography looks like. So you can see that it can converge onto this three-dimensional, very small voxel on the order of 100 nanometers. And then we produce these lattices. This is a computer image, and this is the actual nano lattice that's made out of a ceramic that's completely hollow. So you can, you can see how you can go straight from the computer design to the real thing. And there are several technological applications. For example, in batteries, we can, these na micro nano lattices serve as great battery electrodes because they have tremendous surface area and at the same time can absorb a lot of lithium um, ions without being destroyed. And I'm showing you some of the cracked silicon, um, which has a much higher capacity than graphitic carbon used today. We're also using these as scaffolds for the artificial bone growth. For example, you can grow cells on it depending on how um, stiff and compliant your substrate is. So you can see all of these little um, shady areas, these are actually cells, and these are images of the different osteoblast cells that proliferated and populated this, and so we can grow stronger bones. Um, another application I'd like to point out to point to is the pho in the photovoltaics. So these are actually photonic crystals, and they can trap light because of the specific dimensions and their architectures that they are um, that we're employing. So, for example, we can tra trap all the light into them and not lose any of the sunlight to the reflection. And so with that, I'd like to show you the last image here. So some of these materials are actual biological structures, and some of these were made in our group. And I, I challenge you to guess which ones are the real biological materials and which ones were biomimicked and actually made in our group. So what, we're, what I'd like to reiterate here is that we're using the concepts of biological design, and this is the concept of using hierarchy towards creating damage-tolerant materials, towards creating very lightweight materials with unprecedented um, properties. And so this, this, these are some of the nacre shells and these are butterfly wings that you could see that we can really start using de these design principles towards making extremely lightweight and very damage tolerant materials. I think these are the sheets that I'm showing you here made of these uh, polymer micro trusses. You can see that it fits between my fingers. You can see how lightweight they are and you can see through them 
Um, so you could really design them to be whatever it is that you, um, whatever properties that you're aspiring to attain. Thank you.